As you looked at the title this morning in the bulletin of the message for the morning, you noticed it is, as is seen on the screen, Death and Taxes. You might think, how in the world do you come up with a title like that uh, from Scripture? You know, is this really appropriate? Well, it's really a very complicated process by which I came up with this title. I looked at Matthew chapter 17, verses 22 and 23, Jesus predicted his death. I looked at verses 24 through 27, and he's asked about a matter of taxes. So it was just intuitive, you know, <laughs> death and taxes. We've often heard the statement that the only things in life that are certain that you cannot avoid are death and taxes. And you can't even avoid taxes after you die. That still happens. But in our text, Jesus is uniting these two ideas, and there has to be a reason for it, right? The interesting thing to note, though, about what he is talking about, he is talking about his undeserved death and a tax he did not owe. So there's an interesting little juxtaposition of those ideas for our mind's sake. But let's look at verses 22 and 23 as we consider Jesus' prediction of his death. Here we have these words, As they were gathering in Galilee, that is, the disciples with Jesus, Jesus said to them, The Son of Man is about to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him, and he will be raised on the third day. And they were greatly distressed. Now this revelation that Jesus is making is the second in a series of direct, specific revelations. And Jesus is speaking primarily, if not exclusively, to the group of his disciples. Those 12 men that walked with him for three, three and a half years of his life. It is not something that is announced generally and in public, but it is nonetheless a prediction of his death we could include and resurrection because certainly that plays a role, but we're just leaving it at that for the moment just uh, as we summarize the idea. As I indicated, it is, a, it is the second formal prediction that Jesus makes, but it's not the second time he talks about Death, in some sense, as related to himself. In fact, there are a series of hints that Jesus gives that the disciples could have been picking up on if they had been paying attention. Of course, they're expecting other things, and that's why this doesn't happen. But if you'll look at these texts, we'll not do it right now, you can find in each one of these an indication of death being something that he was going to face or that they would face as a group in the sense of his death. He, followed, he also had given the one formal prediction, which is just in the previous chapter, Matthew chapter 16, and is just a matter of days if, or weeks from this prediction. So he is giving information and he is repeating that information. One of the great laws of learning, repetition. But this is part of Jesus' preparation for his disciples. You see, Jesus is thinking of the disciples not just being here on earth with him during his time of ministry, but also going, with, uh, going on beyond his death, burial, and resurrection to represent him to a lost and dying world. They're going to have a very critical role. This is Bible college, you might say. This is their seminary. They're being prepared, and there is no other preparation coming. As Jesus gives these details, and he will say this at least on one other occasion, that he is going to die and be buried and then rise again, his words gain increasing clarity. Not just with the repetition, but with some of the details. This one happens to be a little less detailed than either number one or number three, and yet there are details here that we can pick up on and that the disciples certainly should have. But though there is additional clarity each time he mentions something like this, it's interesting to note that the disciples would not understand any of this until after the resurrection. Isn't that true of us? We often are given instruction, and we're given it again and again and again, and when does it really sink in? After we should have applied it. 
after something happens that's like, oh, that's what I was supposed to do. Now I think about it. We're all kind of that way. Uh, you know, the disciples shouldn't be looked down upon by us. Rather, they are just like we would have been had we been in their shoes. But we want to notice the particular details that Jesus is giving in this text and draw a little bit more on them than perhaps the disciples did at this point. He says, first of all, that the Son of Man will be delivered into the hands of men. And I think it's very important the title that he uses for himself. He does not just use the personal pronoun I. There's a reason for that. Jesus, right here in the beginning of his information regarding his coming death, is giving his heavenly or messianic identity in a primary position. Now, every time we talk about this Son of Man with any kind of detail, I'm going to repeat the phrase or the text from the Old Testament where it comes from. It's Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. We're not going to look at those this morning, but I want you to get that in your mind. Write it down somewhere where it's going to be something that you will find easily. Because it is critical to your understanding of Jesus Christ's use of this phrase. This is where one like the Son of Man, like a Son of Man, comes to the Ancient of Days in the clouds and receives kingdom and authority and so forth. This is the connection, the messianic connection that Jesus is attaching to every time he uses this title about himself. So it is his messianic identity that he wants them to focus on because Honestly, that clashes with what he's about to say. How can God die? How can a heavenly being be exposed to mortality? Well, they're going to have to discover that a little bit later uh, as we do throughout the epistles. The, <coughs> excuse me. the word deliver in this phrase, the Son of Man will be delivered, gives the idea of betrayal. Betrayal by a, an individual, a man. Why do I say betrayal? Because it's not that he is going to turn himself over, but this is a passive verb that says someone else is going to do the action of the delivering. Not only is a man involved, and we know who that is, as later Revelation gives us his name, but deliver also calls to mind the fact and implies that the Father, God the Father, would not intervene in this situation. And there are two very specific texts in the Old Testament that highlight this truth, that God the Father would not, could not intervene in this situation. The first is Psalm 22, verse 1, which begins with this statement, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now, where do you know that quote from? You know it from the cross. It's one of the statements of Jesus Christ from the cross. Keep in mind that he is quoting from Psalm 22.1, not because he wanted to be super pious and quote scripture, but because Psalm 22 was written about him. And he is calling his disciples' minds to that text by his use of that phrase. But notice he says, my God, why have you forsaken, abandoned, turn your back on me? There is another phrase from the Old Testament that is instructive in this regard. It comes from Isaiah chapter 53, verse 10. And that phrase goes like this. It was the will, sometimes translated, the pleasure of of Yahweh to crush him. It had to happen. We know that this was according to God's plan and not man's, that Jesus Christ would give his life as a ransom for many. It's because that's the only way salvation could be brought to a fallen race of humanity. So this is what we can do derive out of this first phrase. The Son of Man will be delivered into the hands of men. These men will then put him to death. 
That is the literal rendering here of be killed. They will put him to death. This talks about an intentional taking of his life. This wasn't accidental. It wasn't just happenstance, things went wrong. No, it was the plan of God, and it was the intent of these individuals. So in other words, when it says here that they would kill him, that they would put him to death, it speaks of the violent taking of his life in what can be described as an official execution. An official execution, but it was a violent taking of his life. It was the ultimate travesty of justice. But that isn't where the prediction of Jesus Christ stops. He says the Son of Man will also be raised from the dead. It's interesting if you note in Scripture how often certain actions, such as creation, inspiration of Scripture, or even the salvation of our souls, are credited to each member of the Trinity. Did you know that the resurrection of Jesus Christ is another one of those instances where each member of the Trinity is credited with having done it? Because it was a united act, you might say. Well, let's look at three verses that help us establish this. First of all, the Father, God the Father, raised Jesus Christ from the dead with the intent that he be our judge the judge of humanity. Here's a passage on that respect in uh, Acts chapter 17, verses 30 and 31. The word says, The times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he appointed. And of this, he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. So you see the connection there? God the Father raised Jesus Christ to be the judge of all mankind. This is referred to as well in John chapter 5, if you want to do a little bit more background reading. That Jesus Christ is appointed by the Father to be the judge of all mankind in virtue of his absolute obedience here on earth, his dying the perfect sacrificial death, and his being raised from the dead in victory. Not only did the Father raise Jesus Christ from the dead, Scripture also tells us that the Spirit raised him from the dead to prove he is God's Son. Romans 1 verse 4 reads as follows, that speaking of Christ, he was declared to be the Son of God in power according to the Spirit of holiness, the Holy Spirit, by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. So Jesus Christ our Lord is the one who's declared to be the Son of God by the Holy Spirit's raising him from the dead. That's what the verse is teaching us. But it also is stated in Scripture that Jesus Christ raised himself from the dead. And he raised himself, Scripture says, to show his authority over life and death. John 10, verses 17 and 18. For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. I lay down my life. I take it up again. Jesus is asserting that he would be the author of his own resurrection. How does a dead person do that? Well, we know that he may have had a body that was dead, but his spirit was certainly alive. And being God, he could raise his human body from the dead. We could go into all of those in more detail, but I just want us to see that the resurrection of Jesus Christ is something so important that each member of the Trinity plays a role and has a specific purpose in accomplishing that task. But Scripture also says here that he will be raised on the third day. That's key. He will be raised from the dead on the third day. Do you know that this fact is insisted upon 
13 specific times in the New Testament. Sometimes it's in the mouth of Jesus himself. Sometimes it's in the mouth of his enemies saying that this guy said he would raise, be raised on the third day. And sometimes it's in the mouth of the apostles or on, in the, on their pen as they give that unique detail once again. This is the overwhelming way in which Scripture refers to the timing of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, we can all remember that there is another way that Scripture refers to it. And that comes from Matthew chapter 12, verse 40, where Jesus uses the sign of the prophet Jonah. As Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish whale, then the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Understand that three days and three nights and third day are synonymous terms. They mean the same thing. Interestingly enough, this three days and three nights regarding the resurrection of Jesus Christ is only used once in Scripture right there in that text that I referred to, Matthew chapter 12, verse 40. So where you have 13 references, third day, you have to come to the conclusion that three days and three nights means exactly the same thing. We can go into that at another time, but it's just simply to set our minds straight on what Scripture is actually saying. Notice the reaction of the disciples if you go back to Matthew chapter 17, verse 23. Scripture says they were greatly distressed. Just for a moment, parenthetically, let's think back to what happened when Jesus first announced clearly his death, burial, and resurrection. The previous chapter, what was Simon Peter's response? This will never happen to you. He is as much as saying, I will be your bodyguard. I'll stick with you till death. This will not happen. And yet he's the first to deny Christ. Well, here, no one stands up to confront Jesus Christ. They simply have an emotional response, which is understandable. What this text means, or this phrase means, greatly distressed, is that they felt great grief. Great grief. This means that they're gradually understanding what Jesus is saying in the previous chapter, and here they're getting the idea he's saying very clearly he's going to die. They're not catching the rest of it very well. But they at least are understanding this part of the revelation. And their overwhelming emotional response is sadness. As it would be for any of us to hear that a good friend is about to die. So it's per perfectly natural. But I want to explore that sadness just a few moments. I think first of all we could certainly say they were grieving for Jesus' sake. Because of what he is saying is going to happen to him, not just because he's their good friend and their teacher. You see, each of them had grown up in their culture in Israel with certain expectations regarding the Messiah. They've come to the conclusion that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, that he is Messiah. And with that, they have an expectation that Jesus is going to set up, at this time, his messianic kingdom. Remember John the Baptist's message. Repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. Remember Jesus' message picking up on that theme. The same thing. Repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. So they're getting contrary information to what they've been raised on. Has that ever happened to you? Have you ever had a religious, biblical idea that you thought was definitely, certainly true, and then you come to find out that you misunderstood the text? That's happened to many people. Many people have taken things like the mark of the beast, 666, and they have become afraid to even have their, their car license plate have 666 on it. I literally had someone come to me in a dither because 666 was the ending of their driver's license plate, their, their car license plate. 
And I said, wow, yeah, I, I see your concern. You know what I think I would do about that? Nothing. And then I told them, I said, prior to this, a previous place that I lived, our zip code was 15666. Do you know what I did about that? Nothing. Because they don't have any equivalents. But see, many people get a scary notion about the mark of the beast and think that anywhere 666 shows up, that's the devil. Have you ever heard of Route 666? It's called the Devil's Highway. It exists. Seriously, it does. I think it's in Arizona somewhere. Never go on that road. Bad things happen on that. Bad things happen on 322. It's got no correlation with that. You see, that's a biblical notion twisted to an unbiblical end. And that happens. Our goal as we study Scripture is to be Bereans, right? Bereans were those who, when they received truth, they began to study and say, is this really true? This, doesn't, this isn't what I learned before. And that's what the disciples were supposed to be doing at this time, and they weren't. They were just thinking about the Messiah has got to set up his kingdom, so Jesus has to set up his kingdom because he's the Messiah. They had the right thought, the wrong coming of Jesus Christ. That was for the second advent, not the first, but they hadn't figured that out yet. So they're grieving because they expect the messianic kingdom, and if Jesus dies, then that can't happen. You see, part of the Messianic kingdom is deliverance from Rome, and that's what they're expecting. The Roman aggressor is in their land, and they cannot stand it. In fact, the Romans would watch over the people of Israel as they came and went from the temple area and were involved in worship. The Romans were right there from the fortress of Antonio. They could look right down into the plaza of the temple. There was no privacy to worship God. Can you imagine that? Let's imagine we had a government official in his government uniform here in the auditorium with us every Sunday. And we know that everything we say is going to be reported. Where's the freedom to worship God? So the people of Israel are looking forward to the Messiah coming and getting rid of the hated oppressor of Rome. That to say they did not expect the death of Jesus Christ. There's no way. A guy who can raise people from the dead can't die. I mean, just think about it. How, how in the world is this going to be possible? And in fact, they would try. They've already tried Peter standing up in front of Jesus Christ. They will try to keep him from dying. John chapter 11, Jesus says, we're going back to Bethany and I'm going to raise Lazarus from the dead. And they said, don't you remember they were trying to kill you the last time you were in that area? You don't want to go there. We get all the way up to the Garden of Gethsemane, and what does Peter do to try to defend Jesus Christ against the traitorous betrayal by Judas? He takes a swipe with a sword. Trust me, he wasn't aiming for the servant's ear. He was trying to sever the head from the rest of the body. He just wasn't a very good swordsman. You see, the disciples don't get into into humbling themselves and submitting to this plan of Jesus Christ willingly. And I think Peter's presence there in the outer courtyard might have been to see if he could spring Jesus. None of that worked. But the whole point is they don't want him to die. They're going to try to do what they can to keep that from happening. But I don't think they're just grieving for Jesus. I think they're grieving for themselves as well. Because think of their vulnerability. If Jesus is discredited, the disciples suffer shame. Because they've been following this teacher around all over the place for several years. If he suffers, then they might face pain 
and no one here should want to face pain, right? We understand that someone who delights in pain, either inflicting or in receiving, is someone who is in need of help. So they didn't want to go to pain. They didn't want to go through all of that. And worse, if Jesus were to die, that meant they might die too, and they weren't ready for that. So I think the grief has many levels and many facets to it. And that brings us to verse 24. It's not an accident that this right on the heels of what has just been discussed. You see, they've come back together. Jesus has come down from the Mount of Transfiguration. They've had a few uh, confrontations, such as the boy with the demon there in the previous verses. Now he's telling them this as they're walking down the road, and then they come to Capernaum. That's where we come to in verse 24. When they came to Capernaum, the collectors of the two drachma tax went up to Peter and said, Does your teacher not pay the tax? He said, Yes. When he came into the house, Peter spoke to him first, saying, What do you think, Simon? That is, Peter. From whom do kings of the earth take toll or tax, from their sons or from others? And when he said, From others... Jesus said to him, then the sons are free. In other words, they don't have to pay, right? However, not to give offense to them, go to the sea, cast a hook, and take the first fish that comes up. And when you open its mouth, you will find a shekel. Take that and give it to them for me and for yourself. This has been described as one of the oddest stories in the entirety of the book of Matthew. There are a lot of interesting things that happened in Matthew. I don't know how this got that moniker. But the point is, it seems really odd that Jesus says, go fishing, find a fish that has a coin in it. And many commentaries, even conservative commentaries, try to find ways around this literally coming true. You, one of the things you'll note is that verse 27 does, never says that Peter actually went and did this. And that maybe this was just sort of some sort of tongue-in-cheek hyperbole, and Jesus is going to pay for it some other way. I don't think I need to explain things away to help Jesus out of a bind. I don't think he gets in a bind. And I don't think the word gets in a bind. So I can accept it for what it is. So let's look at this and we'll come to verse 27 in due course. Jesus paid what is the temple tax, referred to here as a two drachma tax. That comes from the Greek word didrachma. So the two, tra- two drachmas. Oh, now, what is this? Almost lapsed into Spanish. It's been a while. This is an annual tax to support the temple service. In other words, this is not a civil or a Roman tax. This isn't being brought to the people from some sort of governing authority in the sense of a a political power. So there is no teaching here. Jesus is not saying you don't have to pay taxes. He's not saying I don't have to pay taxes either. We know what Jesus is opinion about this was because very clearly he was asked in Matthew chapter 22 and in verse 20 he says render to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's that is a profound statement which we will leave until we get to chapter 22 but at the very outset of it you have the very clear teaching that there is a certain thing that is due to political authority, to governmental authority. And tax is one of those things. There have been many who from pulpits have thundered forth their judgment that certain taxes in the U.S. or other nations' tax codes are illegitimate, unjust, and immoral, and so we shouldn't pay them. I've known of pastors, even here in the state of Pennsylvania, who have exhorted their congregation and demonstrated it themselves that they ought to burn their marriage license. I counsel you not to do that. Yeah. The same people would say, 
Don't pay your income tax. It's not legitimate. It's not provided for in the Constitution. Only excise taxes are provided for. Therefore, you don't have to pay it. And they end up in jail. I can think of a guy who has had a rather extensive ministry throughout the United States who as a part of his seminars would make this appeal and he didn't pay his taxes and guess what? He ended up in jail. Unfortunately, a number of churches took that as putting him almost in martyr status, certainly in high persecuted status. No, that was exactly what Peter says don't do. He says don't suffer as an evildoer. If you're going to suffer, make it because you obeyed God, not because you disobeyed man. There are there is no reason not to pay our taxes. I could invent a lot of reasons. What it's used for. I despise many of the programs that our government uses our tax money for. Do you not think that people could have had the same situation regarding Rome? Of course they could. But again, this is not a Roman tax. Let's just make it clear. We have that obligation. So taxes are to be paid when due and without bitterness. That's our Christian responsibility. That means at tax day, we don't have permission on April 15th to be grumpy. This isn't right. I shouldn't have to do this. This is a ripoff, man. I'm are stealing my money. So? So? Pay it and hush. Be a good testimony, not a bad one. The world has plenty of bad testimonies. We don't need to add another Romans chapter 13 verse 1 says that government is instituted by God and as God's servants, our responsibility is to pay tax to them in obedience to God. You see, I'm not obeying the IRS when I pay my taxes. I'm obeying God. That's what God said to do. Now, at the voting booth, I should do what I can to try to get the right kind of government, whether that'll work or not. Again, God can change that. I just have to do what's right. But again, that's not the kind of tax we're dealing with. I just needed to put that in there just so people don't get the wrong idea. None of you would do that. I know that. But somebody might somewhere. When the question is put to Peter, um, we could rephrase it slightly because there is an expectation of the answer. We could put it this way. Your teacher does pay the temple tax, doesn't he? There is an expectation of a positive answer. Peter is expected to say yes, and so that's what he does. The question assumes a positive answer, and Peter responds, yeah, sure. Jesus always pays his taxes. Now, he knew Jesus' attitude toward taxes in general. He knew Jesus' practice. Isn't that a good thing? Some people have said that he spoke out of turn when he said what he did, but it was because he understood the character and the teaching of Jesus Christ. So I don't necessarily think that he spoke out of turn. Jesus is going to give him a little bit of a nuance to this whole situation in a moment, but I want us to understand one other issue, and that is that this is actually an optional tax. It's expected of all Jewish men, but... If you couldn't, yeah, many people probably didn't. So it was somewhat optional. It's loosely based on the tax provision that's, that's uh, provided there in Exodus 30, verse 13. Uh, that's based on a census. This is not. Uh, so it's, like I say, it's loosely based on that. But the next thing that Jesus does is teach his exemption to this particular tax. Remember what it is. It's the temple tax. It's not by Rome. It's not by a government per se. And he uses the illustration this way. Kings do not tax their own families, do they? He asks Peter the question. And again, this does not apply to income tax and other things. It just applies to this very particular narrow situation in which Peter and Jesus find themselves. So in other words, kings do not take from their own families. They'll tax everyone else. Uh, we don't have a king in our country. We have those who think they're kings, but that's another matter for another day. But what he is saying is... <coughs> 
as son of God, he is not obligated to pay the tax to support the temple of God. Because in a sense, the temple is his house. It belongs to him. And really, that's the implication behind John 1 verse 11. We don't often read it this way. And I admit that I'm adding a little bit to the verse. I'll explain why. And you'll understand uh, when we finish that up. But John 1.11 says, He came to his own things. Now, that's not in the translation, but it's a neuter plural noun. And that's in contrast to the next thing. And his own people did not receive him. That is a masculine plural. So it's long been recognized that what is being said is that Jesus came to his own things, that is, his own house of worship, his own sacrificial system, his own Jewish traditions, and so on and so forth. And though he came to that niche in society, to his own things that he had created and he had instituted, his own people rejected him, the ones who should have received him, who should have known the symbolism of the Old Testament was fulfilled in him, who should have understood the Old Testament prophecies, and they didn't. And here is Jesus coming to his own things. You remember in two occasions during his ministry, Jesus Christ cleansed the temple. And at least one occasion, he did so with a whip in hand that he had braided for himself. In other words, this was a thought-out, controlled reaction. He wasn't flying off the handle. He wasn't losing his temper. It was a very deliberate act. This is not how the temple of God is to be treated. You know, those are the things that ought to really cause us more grief than things that generally do. Taxes aren't the issue that ought to cause us to be up in arms. The offense of a holy God should. See, many times we're concerned about the wrong things. Jesus is concerned about the right things. So here he says, this is my house. I am the son of the living God. Would God tax me for the maintenance of his house? No. And yet he chose to pay the tax. Isn't that interesting? He says, nevertheless, so as not to offend them, the entire institution of the Jewish religion, but particularly the tax collector and those they may have represented, this temple tax collector, not the general tax collector. This wouldn't have been Matthew's friends from his uh, days before knowing Christ. But what Jesus says is, I will pay the tax, we will pay the tax to avoid unnecessary offense. This word offense is very interesting. It can refer to a trap. It can refer to a scandal. There were certain people that Jesus didn't care if he offended. In fact, he seemed to, to offend them deliberately. Who were they? Pharisees, Sadducees, their ilk. In other words, Jesus was willing to offend hypocrisy. He was not concerned about hypocrites feeling comfortable around him. But on the other hand, he was unwilling to offend ordinary people. And when I say ordinary people, I'm taking in the lowest rung of society, tax collectors and sinners. The people that the Pharisees were willing to offend all the time, Jesus would not offend because he knew that in them there was a conscience that would operate if given truth. And many of them chose to follow him. Jesus knew that nothing could be gained by his insisting on his rights at this point. That's an important thing for us to judge. We all must make similar assessments in our life. Is this particular issue important enough to cause a scandal over? Here are the choices we're left with sometimes. We can either retain our rights at the cost of the gospel, 
or we can forego our rights to enhance the gospel. Paul was addressing this when he said, I am willing to eat no meat while the world stands, if that's necessary for the cause of the gospel. I know I can eat even the meat sacrificed to Zeus and Jupiter and whatever other false gods, because they're nothing. But if it's a matter of offending someone so that they will not listen to or accept the gospel of Jesus Christ, I'll become a vegetarian first. That is just an amazing description of limiting your Christian liberty for the sake of the gospel. And that's something we can learn from. Will our insisting on our rights in a particular situation enhance or take away from the gospel of Jesus Christ? That should be our concern. And then we're told that Jesus paid his tax in the most miraculous and extraordinary way you can imagine. He told Peter to go fishing with a hook. This is not with a net. He's just going out with a fishing rod. Zebco rod and reel. You know. The first fish he catches will have a coin in its mouth. A shekel, as we're told, which is worth four of these drachmas for the two drachma tax, because it's going to pay for two people. Now, you might ask, how in the world does this get there that they would have enough money to pay both taxes? How how does the money get in the fish's mouth? You know, well, fish like shiny things. Maybe a shiny thing falls in the water. and But why didn't it swallow it? Some commentators say, well, it probably did. It's probably in the, in the stomach, and, you know, that's connected to the mouth, so that, that counts. No, I think it was in its mouth. I'm going to go literal here. And why? How? Well, this could be a miracle of omniscience where Jesus simply knows which fish in the entire Sea of Galilee has a coin in its mouth that particular day. And so he sends Peter to the spot, and Peter just, he knows he's going to get the right one, you know, he's going to, well, that, that, that's possible. Could be a miracle of creating or placing the coin right there, just as it bites onto the hook that Peter has, you know, Jesus miraculously places the coin in the fish's mouth. I don't know. Could be a miracle of control, certainly is a miracle of control. If that fish is swimming out there in the Sea of Galilee and it has a coin in its mouth already before Jesus says this, it's got to swim to the right spot and be ready for Peter to cast in the hook and be interested in the hook when Peter throws it in. Anyway, you look at it, there is a lot of control going on here. It's a miracle, and hey, I can't explain it, you can't explain it, but I think there's something interesting going on here. And yes, as I said, I do believe that Peter literally went down and threw his hook into the Sea of Galilee, and the first fish that bit onto it, he pulled it in, and lo and behold, it had a four drachma or shekel piece of money in its mouth. Amazing! You ever thought about this, that Jesus, at the same time he's going to pay the tax, is retaining his exemption? He didn't pull the money out of his pocket. In a sense, you could say God the Father paid the tax for him. Now, if you owe estimated tax payments, don't count on God the Father paying your tax if you haven't paid your quarterlies. Um, just simply saying, you know, this wasn't, a, this wasn't just assuming that God would take care of it. This was a necessary thing that Peter needed to learn and that we need to learn as well. So what are we going to learn from all of this? The first thing I want us to remind ourselves of is that Jesus willingly gave his life for your sin debt and mine. When he talked about giving his life a ransom and then rising the third day, he did that because you and I cannot be saved through any other means. But we also find Jesus Christ as well willingly giving up his rights to provide for our redemption. That goes from his life, from his honor in heaven, even before he comes down to earth, to his life and all that that entailed. It involves here, he is not really being obligated to pay this tax and paying it anyway. Presumably, 
every year or every time that the collection plate was passed around. He's giving up his rights on many, many occasions. Why do we find that so difficult sometimes? And then I want us to remember that he depended on his father to show us that we can too. What is there that you're trying to handle on your own that God would gladly handle for you? And all your worry and all your concern, all it's doing is eating you up inside. It isn't solving the problem. You think it is. But it's like putting a Band-Aid on a gash in your skin. It's not going to really do the job. So it is that God allows his needs to come into our lives that are beyond our control, beyond our ability to resolve. Remember these thoughts. Let God's Spirit speak to you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. It is forever settled in heaven. It is ultimate truth that nothing can be added to and nothing can be taken from. We thank you for what we have looked at this morning and trust that you will, through your Holy Spirit's convicting power, continue to apply it to our lives. We are a needy people. Lord, may none of us come away from the message this morning thinking uh, there was nothing there for me. But rather, may we understand the message that you would speak to us about. You know the need of our heart, the deepest need. We ask that you would meet that and that we would be willing for you to do so. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.